Okay. So we started to do introductions, um, but we've had a couple more people join. So um, what we're gonna, so you remember last time we asked about um, where kind of experiences that you have had in locations where any of our facilities are located. Um, this time we're gonna ask a question that's a little more related to the topic for today. So it will give us a chance to kind of warm up for the conversations that we're gonna have later. So if you could say your name, your role, your organization, and then tell us about something that you are passionate about that you donate time, money, or other resources to. So it can be a something that you, you know, like a volunteer thing that you do, or maybe just a cause that you donate to, um, or something that you just pay attention to, talk about, you know, devote energy to because it's something that you're just really interested in. Um, doesn't have to be super personal, you know, just, uh, but something that would just tell us about kind of, you know, your values and interests um, as a person. And maybe I can just get us started. So Kim McCoy, I'm a senior program manager at Stratus Health, which is based in the Twin Cities. Um, and I would say um, public health is, so public health is my kind of professional background. And even though the work that I do is connected to public health, it's not quite as, it's a, I'm not, I used to work for the state health department. So this is a little bit different than that. And so um, kind of as a member of both the Minnesota Public Health Association and the American Public Health Association, uh, that's a way for me to kind of stay connected and stay grounded in that whole concept of just prevention and that bigger community health orientation. So Sarah, do you wanna go next? Yeah, I can go next. So I'm Sarah Brinkman. I'm excited to be with you all today. I am a program manager at Stratus Health as well and currently live in Minneapolis, but I'm originally from Grand Rapids um, and used to live in Duluth. So I've got connections to two harbors and I'm not sure what the circle in the middle is, which hospital that is. And then we were just talking about my in-laws are from central Minnesota. So um, <laughs> lots of connections around the state. Um, and something that I am passionate about is social justice. And in particular, in my, my job, I get to focus on that in terms of health equity. Um, but so just social justice and racial justice, um, anti-racist work in general. And so I, um, I donate time and money to those types of causes, including um, volunteering for the um, YWCA Minneapolis does some racial justice um, discussions, and I'm a facilitator through, trained facilitator through them. So that's something that I do. Great. Thanks, Sarah. And I'll just call on people as I see you on my screen. So Holly, you're up next. Sure. So I'm Holly, Holly Olson. Um, like I said previously, I'm a registered nurse at the clinic in at Swift County Benson Health Services. Um, we're in Benson, so we're probably that middle circle there that you guys see. Something that I personally am passionate about is Make-A-Wish. Um, when I was younger, my brother did get a wish when he was younger. And um, so I donate money to that. And it's fun hearing the stories of what kids get to do. Thanks, Holly. Christy? Uh, my name is Christy Inger. I am the lead RN care coordinator for Olivia Hospital and Clinic. Um, something that I am passionate, passionate about and donate money to is um, March of Dimes and um, Children's uh, Network, just because um, well, all three of my children were preemies, and so they spent time in hospital and NICU. And so um, those places were really helpful with donating things and, and just being there with resources. And so I um, continue to donate to that. Great, thanks, Christy. Carrie? Hi, I am Carrie Howard. I am a program manager at Stratus Health and um, primarily work on our partnership to advance tribal health 
project with the Indian Health Service Hospitals here in Minnesota and across the nation. Um, one of the things that I am passionate about and donate both my time and money towards is um, here, I live in Bemidji or just south of Bemidji. And here in Bemidji, we have a great nonprofit organization that is called the Headwaters School of Music and Arts. And um, music is one of those things that's always been a really big part of my life. Um, I, in college, was on scholarship to sing and I don't really get to do that anymore. So I needed to find an outlet, an outlet for my musical um, self. And so I joined the board of directors of the Headwater, Headwaters Music and Arts. Um, my niece is, has been taking piano lessons there for the last few years and she loves it. Um, she's also gonna start taking pottery there. And so, yeah, a couple of years ago, I joined the board and um, I just really think that, that the music and the arts like, speak to the soul and we need a lot of that right now. <laughs> a lot of support for our, our mental, emotional, spiritual well-being. So I just had to put my little plug in for, for uh, HMA as well. Great. Thanks, Carrie. Um, Rachel. Hi, this is Rachel. Sorry to join in a little bit late um, from Lakeview and Two Harbors. I just was going to share, I'm passionate about families, healthy families and youth. A lot of the things I spend time and money on has to do with that in one way or the other. Um, I also would follow up with the last speaker that arts and dance, music, theater is a huge passion of mine. And I do think that having healthy youth and families does need to contain a lot of art. Yeah. And, oh, so, great. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Greg. Good morning, everybody. My name is Greg Ruberg. I'm the uh, president and CEO of Lakeview Hospital in Two Harbors. Uh, I'm, my uh, choice is exactly like Christie's, the March of Dimes. Um, when my daughter was two, my wife was pregnant, had uh, preterm, well, a number of pregnancy issues, and we actually spent a couple of weeks living in a hospital room with a two-year-old in a playpen in the corner. So uh, my son was born eight weeks early and everything turned out great. So we support that every year. Great. Thanks, Greg. And Sarah, Sarah DeHaan. You're on mute, Sarah, if you're speaking. Sarah, Sarah is also from Benson. Um, she's our quality care coordinator and stroke care coordinator as well. Okay. So she takes on a lot of a lot of those types of deals and she works also in the emergency room as well. Great. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks everybody for sharing. Um, actually, before we go into the debrief of session one, the, uh, another thing I just wanted to acknowledge. Uh, for the group, in case you haven't seen it, is that uh, our Olivia team received the Good Catch Award for patient safety from the Minnesota Hospital Association this quarter. So nice job, Olivia. Um, I don't know, Christy, if you're if you're even aware of it or want to say anything about it. I know a little bit just based on the I read the article in the MHA newsletter. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, um, I heard about it, but that's about the extent of my knowledge just because I don't work on that side, so. Okay. Uh, yeah, it sounds like it, just very briefly that a medication error was averted using the barcoding system, uh, I think in the ER maybe. Yeah. Um, uh, so good job, Olivia. That's, I mean, those are the exactly the kinds of things we like to, I mean, we don't obviously want the errors happening, but to catch them before uh, they, they actually impact to the patient is, is fantastic. And so, and you know, just that folks are comfortable kind of sharing that for others. Um, 
so that we can all learn from that is great. So way to go, way to go, Olivia. <laughs> okay, so before we move into our topic today, I just wanted to check in with folks and see um, if you remember on our last session, we talked about uh, the motivating vision and, and in particular, kind of how to use narrative and stories to kind of bring others to the table to create kind of a compelling um, vision for, uh, for our coalition and to kind of bring people together um, around a shared purpose and a, and a shared cause. And we practiced a little bit uh, and hopefully you've maybe did a little more thinking about kind of your own story that you wanna tell and how to use storytelling uh, to bring people together, but I just wanted to check in with folks and see if you've had any other thoughts about it. Do you have any questions about the narrative? Um, any other reflections just kind of on that process? Did anybody try it out with somebody else? I guess I have a quick question, yeah. um, Rachel. So just to clarify, are we trying to tell a more personal story or are we trying to start developing our story for our organization? Well, so I th you're gonna do both. Um, so if you remember, there were kind of, there were kind of three different kind of levels of storytelling, I guess, that, that are part of this vision. So, um, so one level is that story of stealth. So it's understanding kind of what brings each, you know, for each of us, we want to understand and, and be able to articulate what brings us to the table, like why population health is important to us. Um, why it's, you know, as you think about those, like the causes that you just talked about, the things that you're passionate about, that you spend your time and money on. Um, I think most of you had a personal story that illustrated why you spend time on those things. And, and ideally we wanna be able to do that uh, in our work as well. Cause I, I'm guessing that, you know, you're, you're not here just because it was a job that was available in your community. I mean, you chose to be part of this profession and to be part of the healthcare community. Um, so, being able to tell your own story and you know what you'll be doing with your coalitions is really building that story of um, you know you you want to be able to also explain why your organization is at the table. It might be that you know the work of the coalition aligns with whatever your strategic priorities are for your organization, or it aligns with needs that you're seeing in your community. What your data is telling you is important. Um, and then together as a coalition, you're going to develop your shared purpose. So kind of what, what everybody at the table can get behind um, and, and be able to tell that story of what you all hope to achieve as a group, as a, as a community partnership. Carrie or Sarah, is there anything you would add? Yeah, I was just going to say too that you know, for the purposes of the homework or the practice for for this project at this point, um, Ashley Arneson from Stanford in Wheaton, she sent me, I think, a similar question, kind of going, I don't really know what my ask is yet. I don't really know what we want to be working on. And I, I just responded and said, you know, make it something personal then if it's about you trying to rally your kids to do the laundry or the dishes, you know, <laughs> like whatever. It's more about at this point, practicing the skill um, than necessarily knowing for sure what you are asking of your community and your community coalition. I don't know if that is helpful or makes it even a little bit uh, a bigger, <laughs> a bigger pot to pull from than than the original but it it was helpful for me in learning these tools and these skills to think about it that way and so like the first example that I did was really about 
I mean, it was about my work team, but it was about encouraging us to pause and take the time to celebrate our success because we often forget to do that and just move on to the next thing. And so it was a little bit different spin on um, on practicing the skill than what we would normally be thinking about. Okay, thanks to you both, that really helps. Anything else? So, I mean, I guess I would just say again, too, that, uh, you know, a lot of times I think we, especially when it comes to work stuff, we, <laughs> you know, we kind of depersonalize it. We don't want to get, we don't want to make it too, you know, too much about feelings or about, you know, kind of who we are as individuals, but you, you also can't take that out of the equation. I mean, it's just like, we all bring our own, uh, our own experiences and our own values and our, you know, our own feelings to all of this work that we're doing. And, um, and it is meaningful. I mean, the work that we're talking about is going to directly impact the health and well-being of our own families and our, you know, our own people, our own friends. And um, so just, I think, trying to be more comfortable um, telling those stories uh, and using them as a way to really motivate people um, and to sort of just remind us all and ground us of, in what's really important. Because, you know, sometimes it's just easy to get lost in the, well, you know, this funder told us we have to do this or, um, you know, or, or we have this strategic plan that says we're supposed to do this and, and we can forget like why in the big picture, why it's really important. Um, so, and, and just as a reminder, you know, if you wanna practice, if you wanna kind of write a story down and just send it to us to look at, um, Carrie and I are both happy to, to do what, whatever we can to kind of help you along in that process. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, who is going to be our presenter for today's topic. Um, Sarah told you a little bit about herself. She's uh, She works with Carrie and I at Stratus Health, and she's been there since 2016, and she's had a lot of experience uh, in a, working on a variety of uh, rural health quality improvement initiatives um, in particular. Um, and obviously, as you just learned from her, she has a lot of connections uh, around rural communities in Minnesota. So we're really excited to have her here today. Um, Sarah, is there anything else that you would that you would highlight? The only thing I would highlight there? is the last thing on my bio says that I live in Minneapolis with my partner and my two children, and they are all home right now with me. So <laughs> if in addition to an addition, another seven-year-old who's also here um, doing school with my son remotely, so if a squawking three-month-old or a nosy seven-year-old poke their head in behind the wall, that's what's <laughs> happening. So life continues even when we work at home. <laughs> Um, I would also just say I'm, I'm an incredibly informal presenter. I really, really like for things to be interactive. Please ask me questions. If you feel so inclined and you can turn your camera on, that's helpful to be able to get that reinforcement from you all about whether what I'm saying makes sense or if it's resonating or if you want to discuss it. Uh, we've got lots of time and a relatively small group, so we can really make this about what's important for you all, that's the goal, right, for you to be able to walk away with some additional understanding. Um, and in preparation for today, I'm assuming that everybody had a chance to watch the video that Kim had recorded before, which was great and did an overview and really aligned nicely with the, um, the written guide that you all have with regards to this topic. So our objectives are to really kind of review and ensure understanding of, you, you talked about the motivating vision. We're gonna understand relationships in coalition setting and practice building intentional relationships through the one-to-one -one meeting. Um, and so we'll just take some time to talk through all of that and hear your questions and, um, and practice, which is 
one of my least favorite things to do is role playing. So I apologize in advance that I got the role playing one because it's not my favorite thing. <laughs> so this is going to look familiar to you. Organizing for change, people plus power equals change. When you think about this equation, you're really wondering who are your people? We're going to talk about that a little bit today. But my understanding is that in the next session is when you're really going to start to kind of chart out who are you looking to engage um, and how can you leverage their resources? What resources do they have? And then what we're actually going to jump to a little bit today is the mobilizing for change piece, which is around how do you engage people? So we're doing things a little, there's never, there's never a, I'm a type A person. I like when things are linear. This is never linear. This is always roundabout. So we're going to talk today about after you've identified the folks that you think you want to engage and you've kind of thought through what resources they might have and what you might have to offer. How do you engage them to bring them forward with you? Um, and then next time you'll talk a little bit more about mapping out who those people are and what resources they have that you want. Um, so once you've identified your motivating vision and to Carrie's point, you can just practice that in a variety of ways. You can use LOA to, to get your partner to do the dishes if you want. You can use LOA for a lot of different things. Um, so what we're focusing on is using it obviously in the workplace and to improve the health of the community. Um, so I want to go back to the intro question that Kim posed so we can go to the next slide. So when you reflect on that welcome question, um, when you think about something that you're passionate about that you donate time, money, or other resources towards, just take a minute here to think back on how did you first get involved with that? Some of you spoke to that. Some of it was personal experience. Um, you had you had a, a child that was a preemie or you knew someone that was a preemie. Holly shared that her, her brother received a wish from Make-A-Wish. Um, Carrie shared her passion for music. But how did you come to be involved and engaged with the organizations that you identified, either by giving time or money or resources to those organizations? Did someone come to you? Did you seek it out? Um, and if you can think of a situation where someone came to you, that would be really helpful. So some of you maybe knew about March of Dimes from having been in the um, been in the hospital and maybe you sought it out because it was important to you. But if you can think of an example of something that you give time or money or resources towards and someone came to you and made the ask, think about what that ask looked like. Um, and then we just wanna do another round robin of, of sharing. So I wanna give everybody a, a little bit of time to think on it. If anyone has an example to kick us off while others are thinking, that's great. And if we have to call on people, we'll call on people, but if people can volunteer, that's awesome too. Um, anyone care to jump in? I can go first. Um, Great, thanks, I Holly. Speak, yeah, I can speak to my brother's Make-A-Wish. Um, I was kind of young when all of it happened, so I wasn't involved in the details. But um, my my somebody from the hospital talked to my parents and presented it to my parents that he would qualify for Make-A-Wish. And then um, I remember sitting around our kitchen table and somebody from Make-A-Wish came out and presented all of, you know, the quote unquote rules on what um, he would have to do and all, all of that. He got to choose three wishes and they all had to be different. He had to just list his first choices and then they would see if they could grant his wish. So somebody come out and met with my parents and they did the asking part. Okay. And then Holly, how did you come to whatever your engagement with Make-A-Wish is now as an adult mm -hmm. and you're donating your time or your money? How did, did you seek them out or did someone seek you out to, to get you engaged in that way? No, I always seek them out. I've always donated to that and it's always kind of something special and, um, you know, hearing the different stories on the wishes that, you know, different kids get. Mm -hmm. So I've sought them out. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have an example of an organization that they're involved in or that they give time or money to where someone sought you out? I guess I can um, talk about that a little bit. When I was working at a different facility, um, I was asked to kind of take a look at how we could work 
harder to um, have a tobacco cessation program. And so I was asked to go and do uh, training and then kind of donate my time to do classes for the American Lung Association. So I went and did training to be a freedom from smoking facilitator. And so now um, when I get a chance, I try to do classes for tobacco cessation. That's kind of been on hold right now with the pandemic because we do group sessions. Um, and it's kind of a little more impersonal via Zoom. And there are people who just don't have the capability. But um, I guess, yeah, I was asked from the medical organization that I worked for to, to move forward with that. Sure. And so you were asked initially by the medical organization that you worked for, but then how, how has the ask looked going forward now that it sounds like maybe you're continuing to do that, even though you don't work for that organization and you might be volunteering time at this point? Mm -hmm. So that's something that I kind of keep on my resume um, as a, a capability. And so now with the organization that I currently work for, I will continue to do sessions that will advertise through our medical facility. But we also work with community partners just to kind of get the word out and see if we can get um, people signed up for it. It does not have to be a, a patient of the facility that I currently work for. It can be anybody in the community. Great. Thanks, Christy. Carrie, how did you come to know about the Headwaters? I'm glad School. you asked. Um, so I, I mentioned my niece has been taking lessons there. So she had been taking piano lessons uh, at the school for probably about a year. And the executive director one day while my sister was there to pick up my niece just said, hey, we're looking for some more board members. Are you interested? And she said, well, no, but my sister. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so I was able to get some of that information from her. And uh, I, I, I think that night or the next day filled out the application. I had been kind of thinking about doing something in the community. We are um, at that time had been fairly new to the Bemidji area. My husband and I moved here from the Fargo area about four years ago. And a, a lot of my family lives here, but I don't know anybody. <laughs> so I was looking for all of these different ways to connect and build some relationships within the community. And this just sort of fell in my lap. And um, it has been a really good experience and I've met some really great people and we've done a lot of really good work around strategic planning and policies and some of the things that like skills that I have from my, my day job have really translated nicely into supporting that organization. Um, and so, yeah, it, if, if that executive director hadn't in a one-off one-to-one meeting, <laughs> you know, casual meeting with my sister mentioned that, um, I, I probably would have never sought it out directly myself. And related, but totally separate. Um, another place where I uh, monthly donate money is to Minnesota Public Radio. And I don't know how many of you are NPR listeners, but at least twice a year, <laughs> they have big campaigns that um, very clearly uh, deliver the message that, you know, this is, if this is of value to you, you know, we would appreciate and welcome your support and at whatever level makes sense to you. And so just, you know, how that message is A, delivered regularly and B, um, packaged, I think is really impactful, which is again, why NPR you know, has been around for what is it, 50 years? I can't remember when. I feel like in the last couple of years they had a, they were celebrating a 50 year anniversary. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's, you know, back to the point that if they hadn't asked um, and hadn't made it clear about why it's important, why it matters, it probably would have fallen off my radar. 
And it's also a good example of why it's really, we're going to get to the point of talking about why it's really important to be intentional about setting up a time. Because now that I've been a sustaining member for a long time, I changed the channel during <laughs> during the member drives because I don't want to listen to it again. So, but if you have an, you know, if you have an attentive audience, then they can't get away from you quite so easily. <laughs> Anyone else have an example of um, how you've been asked to engage in some sort of volunteer or financial donation? This is Greg. I can share a little bit of background on mine with March of Dimes. Uh, previous to having, um, previous to my wife having pregnancy issues and us having a, a preterm child, we received the uh, letter in the mail that had the kind of the return envelope stickers on it. So that was always like, I saw March of Dimes, like, oh, this is cool. We've got some return address labels that we can use, but never really thought much about it. And then our neighbor at one point came over, knocked on our door and said, I'm doing a March of uh, Dimes, kind of a fundraising drive for our community. Would you like to donate? And I remember looking at it and thinking, yeah, we'll donate at kind of the, the lower level because I didn't know anything about it. It was interesting after we had a preemie, how we, we kind of March of Dimes jumped out at us, both in all kinds of different kind of venues, uh, letters, community drives, uh, websites, that kind of thing. So once having, we had that kind of personal experience and the emotion attached to it, we began, began donating uh, much more significant amounts um, where my wife actually took a pretty active role in supporting it. So it had always been there. We just, it didn't mean a whole lot to us until it did, so. Sure, that's great. Thanks, Greg. Anyone else wanna share? Okay. Oh, Rachel, I can go ahead. Yeah. This is Rachel. Um, I have been involved with our uh, friends of the band Shell Park in Two Harbors. And I think just being a small town, people kind of know like who's going to say yes to things, you know, and, and then there's the people who are going to say no. So I was approached by the president and basically our town wants to revitalize a community park and build a new band shell for our hundred plus year city band. And I've been involved with the band, but it hadn't for a while. So um, he invited me to take part in that fundraising and such. So it would have wouldn't have probably happened if the person didn't approach me one on one and just ask. Yeah, and that is um, that's another piece that we're really going to focus. Just ask, or someone can say is no. Mm -hmm. And even in that situation, you've had the opportunity to practice the ask. So when it comes to being uh, Minnesotans and our passive aggressive nature whether <laughs> we come by it naturally or we're nurtured in that direction. It, it's hard to ask people for help sometimes, but you just, if people say no, they say no. If people say yes, then great. Then you've got someone new on board. And if people say no, they might have someone else in mind in Carrie's situation, which is something we're going to talk about too. And I really appreciate that example. Not me, but I got a sister I can volunteer for you. Let me, let me give you her number because she'll do it. <laughs> um, so that's awesome. So um, we're just going to quickly review what Kim went over in the uh, recording that you all watched around the steps. So the key here is that this is intentional. Um, some of the examples that you all have given um, vacillate between either being intentional or kind of in passing. Um, and so what we really want to focus on is the intentionality behind it. This is not rocket science. You do this all the time. This is done to you all the time. It's just thinking through it and thinking through it in a way that hopefully helps to engage the other party um, maybe a little bit more than if it was done in a, in a passive sense. So you could ring the bell at the, at the, um, at the grocery store and hope that people put money in the bucket, or you could do the door knocking and ask the neighbor to donate to the cause, or you could catch the mom on the way out. Or in this case, since we're talking about population health improvement and your organization, this is about really reaching out to people and being intentional about asking them for their time. So the first step is getting their attention. And what we really try to focus on here is that, um, this isn't the hallway conversation. This is the follow-up to the hallway conversation, right? So in the hallway, you might have caught someone or in passing, you might have caught someone and thought, oh, I want to talk to them about X. Don't do the full spiel at the point that you're in the hallway. The point in the hallway is to get their, get their buy-in and set up a, an intentional time and meeting where you have their 
undivided attention. They've set aside time. You're being respectful of their time. You're not keeping them from something. They've got 15 minutes to half an hour to just talk to you and hear about what you have to say. And what we're actually going to learn is it's less about what you have to say and more about you listening and solicit and gathering information from them. So that's a really important point. Um, so it's not that those, those, you know, when you're passing people that you can't be engaging them. It's just making sure that for this particular process that you have their undivided attention and that you have an actual set up time. Um, what you're going to do once you have that time set up is really first briefly describe your intent, interest and purpose. What is it? Why is it that you're gathering with them and kind of get right to it? You don't want to waste their time. Again, you want to be really respectful of the resource that they're offering you. Time is one of is our biggest resource, right? So being respectful of that, get right to it. What is it that you wanted to talk to them about? But you're only going to do about 20% of the talking and 80% of the time you're going to be listening and really moving into that exploration. So by the time you get to establishing these one-to-one -one meetings, you'll have already mapped out who it is you're interested in meeting with and why. And so you'll have the opportunity to really be kind of intentional and in thinking about what types of questions do you want to ask them? Like Kim mentioned, we have the benefit of working in a service-based industry where people do this work because they care. So it's not that we're building widgets and it's not that we're selling widgets. It's that we really care about health um, and we care about our community. We care about our family members. Maybe we got into this work because we had a preemie. Maybe we got into this work because our, our brother had to make a wish for some reason. Like something drove us to do this and we care about this work. So what you get to do is ask people questions that help you understand what their drivers are, what drives them to do their work and, and how can, it's not that you want, I always think manipulate is always used in a negative sense, right? But sometimes manipulation can be a good thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. What you're doing is gathering information to help you understand if their um, drivers, whether personal or professional, align with what you're looking for in the project that you're working on. So you, you're learning more about them so that you can make a decision about whether or not this is a good fit. Some one-to-ones won't result in, in a fit. Sometimes it's not a match. Sometimes you swipe whatever direction you're supposed to swipe. I don't know what, how that works, but swipe left or swipe right. You're swiping in the wrong direction. It's just not going to work. But um, oftentimes what ha ends up happening is you find that there is some sort of a connection that can be made and that there is an exchange that can happen. And that's the next step is the exchange. So after you've kind of elicited and explored from them, what it is that drives them and is their interest? What are their values? What are their skills? What are the resources that they or their organization have to offer? Then you make an exchange. So what you're thinking about is, okay, is this, is this a match? And if so, then what should I be asking for next? Do I want to invite them to another meeting? Do I want to ask them for a commitment um, of time or money? Do I want, do I already have a coalition started and I want them to join? Am I starting a coalition and I want them to be a founding member? What does that exchange look like? And then you end by seeking the commitment. So you don't just ask the question and leave it hanging. You get their commitment to follow through. Um, and that's another thing that I find that, um, when we've gone through these trainings, we've gone through it with folks who are from the East Coast. They're a lot better at getting commitments <laughs> than Minnesotans are sometimes. Sometimes we just pose the question and we leave it hanging and we don't really, we don't follow through and get that commitment. It's hard for us to do that. So, um, so really making sure that you get the commitment at the end. Any questions about what the process looks like? We're gonna, I'm gonna do an example with one of you who will volunteer. Um, very graciously and willingly to be a guinea pig. Uh, and then um, we'll get a chance to practice too. Sarah, maybe just a couple things I would add. This is Kim. Yeah. Um, uh, so, I mean, I what, what comes to mind for me when I, like when we first started thinking about this or kind of being trained in this process, um, as Sarah said, we do it all the time. I mean, I think about it, like when, when this happens for me, most obviously in my current life is when students like graduate students will reach out to me and say, Hey, I'm interested in 
learning more about public health or I'm thinking about doing this as a job when I graduate, would you be willing to spend some time with me and just talk about, you know, kind of what you do, like what brought you to this field and why it's meaningful to you and what, you know, and it's, you take like a half an hour and they ask you a whole bunch of questions and um, they may not get to that commitment part at the end, but a lot of times there is, hey, do you have an internship I could do, you know, next summer so I can learn more, you know, those are kind of the, the more obvious examples for me of something like a one-to-one. -one. The other thing I think about is that, you know, a lot of times when, for, for a lot of the groups that I'm a part of professionally, you know, coalitions or committees, it seems like most often what happens is somebody reaches out to our organization and they say, we need a body to be on this, <laughs> to be part of this group. Um, and so people get assigned and they show up at the table and they may or may not be really invested in the work that you're doing. Um, so for me, this is just a different way of bringing people to the table. It's really seeking out people who have a commitment to the work and learning ahead of time about what brings them to the table and, and why it's actually meaningful for them to be involved. Um, so I, I think you can even do this with people maybe who you have worked with for a long time, but just have never actually sat down intentionally for a, you know, I mean, 30 minutes even is a longer period of time than a lot of us sit down with somebody else one-to-one -one and kind of figure out what, what really drives them to be there. No, those are great points, Kim. I, I like to think about this too, in terms of a lot of the work that I do is with um, critical access hospitals and their state flex programs nationally. And we end up talking about the sticky wheels a lot when it comes to quality improvement. That one nurse who says, this is how we've always done it. And I'm not changing how I do it. Finding out what drives that person, why they reminding them gently and slightly passively how, why they got into this work by asking them those questions might just be the, you know, the little push that they need to remember that this isn't a daily grind. They do this because they care. Um, and that is one of the huge benefits that we have of working in healthcare. I think another really important thing that Kim noted is that often we get asked, you know, we need a body. Um, and, and you're going to talk about this as you think about mapping your mapping actors and figuring out who you want to ask. Sometimes that request goes to the top, right? So our CEO gets a request and then she's like, okay, so who, who's going to fill this? And we often think that you have to have the head of an organization at, with their buy-in. And leadership is really important and formal leadership is important. But what, what kicks here is passion. If people are passionate about it, they will bring whatever skills they have and you will find that that mix of skills and the resources that they have behind them from the organization that they work at is, is going to be much more impactful than getting a CEO to say yes, who, and they literally are just a body because they have so much else going on and they can't give the time and attention that maybe the project needs or deserves. So sometimes that they're the right fit, but don't always assume that it needs to be the head of the business or the head of whatever. Um, it's the, and, the, and you can have these conversations and these meaningful one-to-one -one conversations. And in one situation, it's not a fit, but then you have it in your back pocket for the next time when it is a good fit. Um, so like Carrie's sister might've said, no, I'm not good for that. My sister's better for that. But if you need help with the bake sale next week, I'm a really good baker. You know, like you might find out what, what skills they have to offer and what they are willing to give. So we'll do a little, just a little practice session one here. We'll just do an example. Is anyone willing to be my, my person that I ask? I'm feeling brave. See Holly reaching for the mic. I'll do, it. I'll do it. All right. Thanks, Holly. So here's the thing. We, this is one of those things where role playing doesn't work out really well. We have to pretend for the purpose of this example that I reached out to you ahead of time and intentionally set up a time to meet with you. And again, that is a really important step in this process that often gets passed. We kind of work ourselves up and then we ask the question and then we realize, oh, we, we should back up a little bit because we really do want to take that time to get to know what 
drives you. So for the purposes of this example, Holly and I met in passing and I said, hey, do you have half an hour next week when I could, I want to run something by you? And Holly said, yes, she was very gracious. And so now we're meeting. Um, so I'm going to start by just thank you so much, Holly. I know that you have a really busy schedule and I appreciate you taking time to meet with me. I'm really excited to share with you this project that I'm working on. Um, there's, I think there's a lot of potential benefits to this project, but in particular, I think you might be interested because it has the potential to really improve wellness in our community. So I am working to bring together a group of folks from various backgrounds and interest groups to build some new trails in the area. I, especially over the past year with COVID and having kids at home and the need for social distancing, I have found that having access to safe outdoor activities is just so important for our physical and our mental health and well-being. And I want to make sure that as we're, you know, this group of people who are really interested in this, as we're approaching it, that we are engaging the whole community and not just building trails, but doing it in a way that's really going to hopefully improve the health of the overall community. So we'd really love to have some engagement from someone at Benson Health Services to help us think through that. Um, and so as you can tell, I'm super excited about it. We're gaining a lot of traction with businesses and schools, and it would be great to get someone from your organization, maybe you or someone else that you know on board. Um, so we're getting started, but before I tell you more, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the work that you're doing at Benson Health Services to improve community wellness. So how, how did you even get into your role in the first place? Sure, sure. So um, I started with my role here previously. I was a nurse at the hospital and um, uh, they created this position for me for the population health and um, for the annual wellness visit. So I primarily focus on um, Medicare age and the overall wellness. So I think I could be help with the um, with the tracks, um, promoting it specifically in the 65 plus. I think that's a great idea. Um, we could also maybe involve some of the pharmacies in town. Um, I know a lot of elderly are on medications and maybe we could put some advertisements up there if they're interested in helping with the project or connecting or uh, maybe some helping with raise some money for it or anything like that. That's awesome. That would be great. Yeah. So what, what kinds of things are you doing um, to improve the health of that population? Like what are some of the, the initiatives that you guys have going on? Sure. A lot of the things that we um, are promoting are screening, screening. So like mammograms, the bone densities, those types of things. But during the visit that I typically do with them, I also go over how to maintain, you know, a healthy weight, how to eat good, those types of things. So the walking trails would be a great thing that I could highlight even within the visits. Awesome. That's wonderful, Holly. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate that you're excited and on board. Um, would, what would, what do you think about as a next step? Do you, are you the appropriate person to, to stay connected with? Do you have, is there something that, is there someone else that you would like to invite or should I follow up with you? And uh, we have a meeting next Tuesday. Can I send you the information about that? Yeah, send me the information. I do have a couple other people from our facility that might be interested that might bring some other things to the table other than I can bring and I can invite them to this meeting as well. That would be awesome. Yeah, I so I'll send you the information and then if you want to pass it along to them, then um, maybe I can follow up with you in a couple of days just to confirm who's going to be able to come. We just want to make sure that we have you guys on board from the beginning. Yep, that sounds wonderful. Send me the information. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And then you take a bow and you clap and the whole nine yards. Was, <laughs> I really dislike role playing, but nice job, Holly. You were you were an easy, an easy person to role play with. Sure. So um, I think on the next slide we have some. Um, debrief questions and actually that, 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 yeah so the debrief is next I did make a couple updates to slides Kim so I'm not sure if those got through to the ones that you have open if we get there I'll, I'll share my screen so what did you hear and what did you see in that exchange um, between Holly and I it certainly wasn't half an hour <laughs> I think getting people to talk about what they're already doing for initiatives opens the door for you to ask them for additional help on projects. 
good call. Yep. Any other? I noticed right away that um, Holly was already connecting the dots to say, here's how I think I can help. And here's the specific population that I can really help with. And here's some other people within the community or organization that I think we should also pull in. So it was like, like a one-to-one -to, -one to the exponent of three, or, you know, yeah. like that, then it like opened up all of these other avenues or ideas um, for additional people to seek out and to try to, you know, bring into the conversation as well. Um, something that I noticed was confirmation of when we're talking, oops, sorry, <laughs> when we're talking next or what we're going to do next, like there's a confirmed plan on what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. Yep. Any other? I thought, Sarah, you were really clear at the beginning about like why this was important to you. Um, and kind of what's going on in the world right now that made this that work kind of relevant to everybody, to the larger community. Yeah, and I could certainly write a story of self about being at home with kids and COVID. Mm -hmm. <laughs> could write a, I could write a book. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, so if the next slide isn't do's and don'ts, let me know. And oh, it is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I pulled this um, out of the guide. This should be familiar to you all too, but just, just a quick like reminder, the do's and don'ts for how this works. Make sure that you're scheduling time for the conversation. Don't, and don't be unclear about the purpose or the length. Don't be like, hey, I want to chat with you next week. And then just, you know, be very clear so that people know that they're, you don't want to waste their time or your time. Um, follow the five steps. Uh, don't try to persuade rather than listen. You don't want someone to agree to be on your project if they don't want to agree to be on your project. That's a waste of your time and a waste of their time. Um, really, I hope what what I conveyed was enthusiasm about it. You don't need to be afraid to ask. You are giving someone an opportunity and what you're trying to find out is if this opportunity is a good fit for them. Again, the worst thing that they can say is no. The best thing they can say is yes. And then you have a new partner in the work. You're, you should be listening about 80% of the time and sharing your own experience about 20%. Um, just really trying to get to the point, but also make it compelling. Um, describe the vision that conveys a shared set of interests for change. So, you know, like I, in my example, the schools are on board, there's local businesses on board. We really want to get the health, the healthcare providers in the community on board because we think that this is a compelling interest for all of those different stakeholders. Um, and be, again, clear about the when and what, what is going to happen next. So really making sure that you end with that. So the next kind of step in this process is for you all to practice. So I'm gonna, Kim and Carrie, I'm thinking since we're just, we're down to four, if we just wanna do it all together, we were thinking of breakout groups potentially, but um, Holly already volunteered. So she's off the hook for the first one, unless she really wants to be the initiator. Um, but could I, could Rachel or Christy or Greg volunteer to be um, the initiator of a one-to-one -one? and you, we know you're, if you want to talk about what your population health project looks like in your community, or if you want to talk about what you wrote your, um, your narrative around, um, you can use those as examples. And we'll just do one or two and kind of just get a feel for what, what this looks like. No takers, huh? I can initiate, but I still have to think of what I might be initiating. <laughs> sure, sure. And it could be it could be one of the examples that you gave from earlier too, Rachel, of like your band shell thing in the community or something that you're involved in. It doesn't have to be your population health project. 
do you want to practice what does someone else want to volunteer to be the person that she's asking or Kim or Carrie can volunteer for that too. Oh, Christy, I'm muted. I can do it. <laughs> Great. All right. So um, maybe Kim, if we could go one more slide forward, then we'll have the um, the steps laid out there for you again too, Rachel. All right. So who am I asking again? Me, Christy. Sorry. Yep. <laughs> okay. My phone, so it's so tiny. Okay. And we've already set up a one to one meeting and we're meeting together right now. Correct? Yep. So, hi, Christy. I am Rachel and I have been a part of the Two Harbor City Band for quite some time. And I know that our community is trying to pull together to revitalize our community park and build a new band shell for the band. However, this is a really big project for the whole town because the park is used for all ages, people who enjoy music, but also festival goers and um, visitors and, and children and families use the park. So we are hoping to redesign this space to be accessible for, for all ages and abilities. And I wanted to approach you today to tell you um, how important this has been in my life, but also how I think you could fit into the project with some of the skills that you have to help with the fundraising efforts and getting the community on board with this initiative. So can you tell me a little bit about your past um, experiences with small town um, fine arts? Sure. Um, I was involved, you know, in our community, um, choir and pop choir and actually one of our church choirs as well. And so music is a big passion at our house. My children really enjoy it and do lessons and singing with, um, instruments. So that's something that I would definitely be interested in helping you with. Um, one of the things that I personally am good at is baking. And so maybe there's something that we could do to incorporate some sort of a bake sale or something and get the kids involved. Cause I think they would think that was fun. Um, I do cupcake decorating. So maybe we could do some sort of fun cupcake decorating class for kids. Neat. I like the idea of involving younger children and families and obviously baked goods. So I, I was wondering if you'd be willing to sit on the committee fundraising committee and um, just share some of your ideas and um, invite people who else who you also think could help out. Sure, that sounds like it would be a good idea. Excellent. So I'm, I will add you to the next email invitation and let me know if anyone else should be included on that. OK, sounds good. I'll watch for that. Thank you. Thanks. Nice work, ladies. Clap, clap, clap. That was great. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. So what, if, bef between the two of you, so if you two could kind of help with the debrief here, um, I think there's, a, there's on the next slide, again, some questions. So thinking about what went well, where do you think you might want some more practice? Um, how did it feel when you spoke and how did you feel listening to what others were sharing? So Rachel, do you want to want to start with how what went well? Where did where did it feel like, okay, I got this. Where might you want to practice? Yeah, I guess I was cut, I'm guessing a little bit because I wasn't sure if she would have something to contribute um, in this area, but I think that I could have pulled in a little bit of more um, history about the group and other people that were already passionate about the cause to sell it a little bit better before I jumped ahead to the big ask. Yeah, that's um, one thing that we, I didn't talk about yet. I think Kim mentioned it in the recording and you'll talk about it when you think about who you're going to reach out to is if it's someone who's not known to you, you tell them how you came across them. So I missed that step and I apologize for that, but you know, like, 
the executive director of the school, when they reached out to Carrie, didn't just reach out to her blindly. They said, hey, your sister told us to reach out to you. So we are, you know, like, how do you know that person? And when you're role playing, that's really hard to capture. But when you start to map out who you're going to reach out to, it's either that you already know them or you know someone who knows them. And that is the beauty of small towns is you know, you're, the six degrees of Kevin Bacon goes out the window. It's two degrees at the most, right? <laughs> everybody knows everybody else. So, uh, you know, you were my, in my mom's fourth grade class or you, your brother is on my brother's hockey team or whatever that looks like, like you've got those connections. So you get to make that a little bit more personable up front um, and can help kind of make those connections right away. Other thoughts from either of you about how it felt to be asked, how it felt to ask? I mean, I still think that I don't want to bother anybody. So I don't, it's really hard to ask. And maybe it's just a yeah. fear of reading, but yeah. you don't want to make anyone feel burdened by what you want them to do. So Minnesota yeah. nice. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard. It is hard. And I think what we sometimes do is we give them an out before we've even asked them. There's no pressure at all, but I just wanted yeah. to, you know, or I know you're really busy, but I just, uh, yeah. but if you can't, don't worry about it before they've even had a chance to answer. That is tough. And just sitting in the silence of the moment and mm -hmm. being okay with if they say yes or no. And if they say no, saying, you know, I really appreciate you being honest with me. Is there anyone else that you can think of that you could point me to and just being gracious in that moment but if you really care about it and you're really yeah. passionate about it then it's not a burden that you're putting on someone else because if it's important to you it's important to other people right so if we can't all give all of our time and money to every thing it's not possible um so we want to find the people who are going to say yes the other thing to remember too I, so what I was thinking, um, Rachel, because I don't know if you knew the answer to the question ahead of time, but if Christy has said, you know what, I don't really have any experience with community fine arts organizations or activities, um, then, you know, at that point, you might just say, oh, okay, and, you know, can, can you tell me, do you know others, or can you tell me about what's happening in your community, and maybe I can Maybe you can help me get in touch with somebody who would be a good fit for, for this project. So, you know, you're, it, I mean, that might happen sometimes, I think, as Sarah mentioned, that you have a conversation and it becomes very clear that that person is not a good fit for what you're doing. Yeah. All right. I, Sorry, Sarah, I am a little curious to hear from Christy what it felt to be on the like receiving end. Like, did you feel, did you feel like it was easy to say, hey, yeah, I can see how this might make a connection or did you feel, I mean, like pressured to have to have an answer or how did that part feel? Um. Role playing is always difficult for me. <laughs> um, I think that Rachel did a really good job. I'm actually kind of used to being on the receiving end of these types of questions, and I'm really bad at saying no. Um, so Minnesota nice is right there too. But um, I think that she did a good job. I think that the more that you can really show that you're very passionate about what you're asking, the more likely that you are to have people to want to participate. Um, and and also, yeah, if they're, if it's directly relatable to them, it's going to be easier. Like Kim said, if I have had nothing to do with any kind of arts or music or anything like that, I'm probably going to be like, well, you know, sorry, not really my cup of tea. Um, so obviously you're going to get some people that say no, but I think the more that you can really express that you're passionate about it and why you think it's important, the more likely you are to get people to be on board. And you might end up being the person that comes and buys the cupcakes instead of making the cupcakes, you know, right. so you might, you might have just planted the seeds so that when they see the flyer about the event that you're doing, they think, oh, yeah, they asked me about that. We should go check it out. Like, yeah. no, I can't give all my time and money to that activity, but I can still support it in whatever little way is possible for me. So. Yeah. Okay. 
So I've got some key takeaways on the next slide, I think. So my key takeaways are that one-on-one -on -one meetings are intentional, but they are not rocket science. This isn't meant to be difficult. This is pretty straightforward. Like we said, we do it all the time. It's just about being more intentional about it and maybe getting some of that nervousness about the ask out of the way before you do it. Take doing your breathing exercises or a little meditation, whatever it is to just re recognize that it's not personal. If someone says, no, it's not personal. It's, it's actually a good thing. Getting a no is better than getting a yes that they didn't mean. So just being accepting of that. And that is what I had. What uh, questions, comments, Carrie or Kim, anything we missed? Yeah, Sarah, I was just going to say, um, I think the other thing just, to, you know, we did these quickly and they were like, you, you know, like Rachel didn't have any time to think about the questions she was going to ask. Um, but I think what's really key to this is being really thoughtful ahead of time about the questions that you're going to ask. Of this other person. So, I mean, you want to be really thoughtful about making sure that you're asking questions that are going to get you the information that you really need. And, and I think for both of you to be able to make a good decision about, in this case, like whether Christy was a good fit for this project. So, if you, if, uh, so I, I don't think it's as simple as thinking that you can just invite somebody to a meeting and then sit down with them and sort of ask whatever comes to mind. I do think it's important to really plan out your questions ahead of time so that you can be sure you get the information that you really need. Yeah, and that is, that's the, 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 the non taking this entire L approach <laughs> that you're learning and doing it in a linear, like, okay, this week we're gonna learn this. I think this will make a lot more sense after next week when you think about, or next time, who are you reaching out to and why are you reaching out to them? Then you can really think about what types of questions you wanna ask them, what you wanna leave with, what type of commitment you wanna leave with. Um, sometimes you're just asking for money. Sometimes, you know, not just, money is a big thing, but time is the most, you know, valuable. So sometimes asking money for money is a little bit different than asking for um, a, a commitment of time, or you're asking for an organization to throw their weight behind something, but you don't actually need their time. You just need them to sign on to a pledge that says that, you know, that they're doing this or to donate their printer or to donate whatever, like you'll, you'll be very specific about what you're asking for and you'll know ahead of time. So these, um, um, this will start to make a little more sense once you've done that exercise. You know, one other thing I've just been thinking about um, today is that, you know, though we're thinking ahead of time and planning ahead of time what our ask is, it's still a really informal, personal, one-to-one -one conversation that, you know, hopefully... It doesn't feel like there's a lot of pressure. You don't have to say exactly the script that you've written for yourself. Um, it really is a casual conversation. And again, when you think about like, I'm gonna ask this question and then sit back and listen 80% of the time. Like, I feel like that takes some of the pressure or maybe the fear around the process off of yourself a little bit. Um, when you kind of go into it with that mindset of, I've got a few key questions that I want to ask. I want to get at this, this, and this, and I'm just going to let them talk. Um, because I think, you know, when we think about formal meetings or when there's more than one other person we're talking to, then it feels a little bit more nerve wracking, I guess. So I think, you know, both in Sarah's example with Holly and the one we just saw too, it was like a, a real conversation, right? It didn't feel like a business meeting or transaction. Great point. Thanks, Carrie. Any other thoughts or questions about that process? Right. Kim, back to you. So next steps between now and the next time we get together in March, later in March, it, 
it might be almost spring by then. I love that idea. Um, what we'd like you to do is have at least one one-to-one -one meeting with somebody who you would consider including as a partner in your population health community coalition. Um, it, you know, I, I, if, if I think if it's more comfortable, you can pick somebody who you've known for a while. You can even set it up as, you know, this is a new skill I'm working on. Um, would you kind of help me out? I'd like to try it with you. And, but I'm also really interested in <laughs> engaging with you about that project, but that can kind of take some of the pressure off maybe if you're nervous about doing it. Um, but, you know, spend a little time just thinking about like what kind of questions you would ask and who you might want to engage. Um, you, and you can also think about ways to practice this with other things that you're interested in. So maybe some of those causes that you talked about, if you're, you know, if you, if you want to get others involved in the March of Dimes or, um, you know, you, you're, you're fundraising for the, the band shell or a park in your community, or maybe, you know, you, you're trying to get others engaged in activities at your school. Um, use this, you know, to, to look, look for any kind of opportunity where you can just practice this skill a little bit um, so that maybe it will just be a little easier once we get to the point of making those formal invitations to join your population health coalitions. Um, Friday, we'll send out the materials uh, and the next video for session three. We'll also send out the recording of this session. So if you want to go back and kind of look at the kind of see the principles or kind of review the examples just to see how it worked, you'll be able to do that. And then if you haven't completed your um, population health readiness assessment, we just want to remind you to keep working on that. The idea is that uh, all of your organizations that you'll complete that, that readiness assessment by uh, the time we finish these leadership for organizing and action sessions. So June, um, we want you to have that assessment, actually probably the end of May, we want you to have those assessments completed because then what we'll do is uh, Carrie and I will set up one-to-one -one meetings with each of you to review the results of those assessment, kind of look at where you're at with building a coalition and talk more specifically about the next steps for your particular organization and your community. All right, any other questions or Carrie, anything you would add? Okay, um, Carrie and I will probably also reach out to each of you uh, in the next few weeks, just to check in about how things are going, you know, see if you need any support with that readiness assessment. Um, if you need anything from us to sort of help with practicing the tools um, and just to get kind of, this is this kind of our chance to do a one-to-one one, one -one with you about, um, you know, what, what you're thinking about as we, as we move toward building these community health or population health coalitions and starting to build those action plans um, that you'll be working on in the future. But it'll give us a chance to just get to know each of you in a little bit more detail. So that's what to look forward to. Again, feel free to reach out to uh, us at any time. Um, we're glad to have you all here and uh, hope that this is, these tools are gonna be valuable. We, uh, we use them all the time across multiple projects now that we have learned them and have had a chance to practice them. Um, so we hope that's where this goes for you too, is that you find other ways to to use the, the skills that we're learning through these sessions. Any final comments or questions? Okay, Just thanks everybody. All of you. Thanks. Yeah, look for more information from us on Friday and then reach out if you have questions or need Thank anything you. else. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.